Well, now, your career has been occupied with the optical observations, and you trace that to your fourth grade. Do you remember what triggered it, and what was your first camera? Um, well, what triggered it was a, an, an interest in uh, this folding Kodak Ektar camera with a, just a straightforward little camera that uh, my parents had and um, my dad said, well, if you want to try it, you can go ahead. And I wanted to get pictures of our um, folk dancing group at the fourth grade where we all had partners, very embarrassed with having to stand there with a, a little girl all, all dressed up in some kind of outfit um, that was supposed to be some European folk dancing outfit. And unfortunately, the teacher who took the pictures wiggled the camera, so all of my pictures were blurry, and the pictures she took on a simple box camera, where she just flecked the edge of it, they were all clear. And so that was my first failure there. So I, I, <clears throat> I learned the value of a tripod. Yeah. Well, but you also went on to build your own darkroom, didn't you? Yeah. I, then started into it more seriously, and I built it out of cardboard uh, in the basement and sealed it with tape so that the light couldn't get in and that sort of thing. So it, uh, I spent a lot of time with chemicals, and I think that, that one of the greatest things in, that's in the development of modern um, technology is the digital camera where you don't have to go into a dark room and smell ugly chemicals. It's really... It's really a great, a great thing. And so. Well, I've talked to a couple of photographers, and the beauty about having a film camera, though, is you necessarily have to limit the number. <coughs> I know some digital photographers who take thousands of images, and then they have to comb through them. Uh, yes, I, I think my wife has an opinion on that. <laughs> now, did you take uh, pictures, or like you, you took it at the school dance, did you ever take pictures of the paper or do any documentation that way? Well, I, I, I did, um, I was a photographer for the Grand Rapids Herald and the, um, the correspondent in Manistee where I grew up was um, uh, interested in getting pictures of local events. So I started taking pictures of local events and getting them in the the Grand Rapids Herald. Um, my biggest scoop was uh, we, um, we traveled north to the, um, what they call the tip of the mitt, which is the Mackinac Straits of, of uh, Michigan. And uh, the Mackinac Bridge was building at that point. Uh, they, hadn't, they didn't have a roadbed yet, but they were stringing the uh, wires from the towers. So we paddled out to the, um, we had a canoe and we paddled out to the, uh, it was a Sunday, and we paddled out to the bottom of the, um, to the dock at the, at the bottom of the, these large pylons that they have at the, for these suspension bridges. And uh, there was no one there and there were, the only sign said, when you come aboard, come aboard with safety in mind. And of course we had safety first in mind. So we went aboard and found that these, these bridges consist of uh, about 10 foot co compartments uh, where the, there's a ladder in each one. And so you can climb up there inside the, inside the pylon and you're not re you don't have to look out over and be, get vertigo and this sort of thing. So we just kept climbing up. There were, five, there were 55 10 foot sections. <laughs> So we were 550 feet up in the air when we came out on the platform where they were putting these, um, uh, the wires, stringing the wires across to hold the bridge up. Uh, so I took pictures all around and sent them to the Grand Rapids Herald and it was the first pictures from Mackinac Bridge so you could see all of the, um, both the north and the south, penin southern peninsulas of Michigan. Um, that was my biggest scoop. Yeah. Well, you talk about canoeing. Did was out the outdoors important for your family? Did you oh, love yeah. the outdoors from the get go? My, my dad was a big fan of fishing and 
and that sort of thing. And so we did a lot of that together. I saved up and got a canoe and um, it was, uh, well, I was going to be a forest ranger for a long time uh, until I graduated from high school at least and because they all worked outside and it was good, good, good work. Yeah. And you say both your parents went to college during the Depression when going to college wasn't the customary thing. So I guess it was a foregone co conclusion that you would go to college. Yeah, I, it was just a question of where. So. Yeah, and you didn't choose any of your, your parents' alma mater. No, my, my grandfather had been at the University of Michigan and I applied there and, and the Kalamazoo my, where my parents were, but um, uh, Reed College uh, was um, brought to my attention and um, I said, gee, go west, young man. <laughs> uh, and I'm really glad I did because the country is much more exciting there than in Michigan, I, I can say that. Well, we'll get to that part of it, but Reed also has a sterling intellectual reputation and uh, as both science and liberal arts. What stands out in your mind from Reed, uh, apart from meeting Tony there? <laughs> Um, well, outdoors, we, we were able to, uh, the Reed College had an outing club and, and they had various um, trips around the Northwest and it was great to get to know um, the, the, uh, the Northwest in that way. Uh, we, Crater, we, we spent weekend at Crater Lake and C Cannon Beach and, and this sort of thing, but um, I think the mountains and skiing were the big thing. They have a ski cabin on Mount Hood, and so we would go up on the weekends and uh, and ski. Is this uh, downhill? Downhill, the downhill. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually not much of a, a cross country skier, actually. Well, now I, I got an email from uh, Kurt Olmsted, who said his dad, Tom Olmsted, knew made an early ascent of Mount Hood and you skied down from the summit, is that right? No, that, um, our, my freshman year, I came back from Christmas vacation early and we, um, we wanted to be the first, we were freshmen and you know, um, it was exciting and we um, wanted to be the first ones to the top of Mount Hood of the year 1955. So um, we took the bus up to a government camp and, and to um, Timberline Lodge and uh, stayed and walked up the, um, the ski lift to the hut at the ski lift and, and slipped in and, and slept there overnight and woke up at dawn. So we were that much ahead of the parties behind us to go to, to climb Mount Hood, the first, be the first to the top. Uh, in 1955, and um, we could see two other parties down below. One of them was Fred Ayers, a professor of chemistry who, who was a big climber, and he had been an Aconcagua in South America uh, climbing. And um, there was a party led by one of the big guys at our at Reed College too. I still have a picture of them. We were coming down from the summit. Uh, and they were just, we, so we could see them up on the summit because we had been there first. So I got a great picture of them. But uh, we could see these guys coming up the, behind us, you know, and they're, they're moving along. So we were first on top for 55. But I had forgotten totally about that until you got this email from Olmsted. Uh, Olmsted was uh, quite a character, actually. Yeah. Well, it sort of sounds like your reputation preceded you too. I mean, he, he learned about this. But I have to ask also, I understand some pretty big hitters scientifically had offspring at Reed College at the same time you were there. Is that right? Yeah, it was, it was really actually fascinating to see how they cope with the fame of their fathers. Um, now, who are we talking well, about? Well, uh, Fermi had a, a son. Uh, he was a chem major at, uh, at Reed at that time. Uh, Linus Pauling's son, Krellen. Um, Sigre was a physicist, an Italian physicist. Uh, his 
he was a really great guy. He was a history major and, and just didn't try to be a scientist at all and had a great time. Um, spent a little time with him and he, he in California. He was a, a good guy. And um, E.O. Lawrence, the, the inventor of the um, cyclotron, had a daughter there. Um, I didn't know her very well, but she ran off with a guy named Michael Nelkin, who I believe is a famous financial wizard in New York at this point, but he uh, apparently we got a visit from um, Lawrence. They would come up and, and lecture to the and the physics journal club and and um, uh, we would, uh, uh, so they could visit their kids at the school, and uh, this time he was trying to talk her out of um, Michael Nelkin. But um, anyway, it's, um, and Oppenheimer was there too. Oppenheimer was, uh, he was, um, he was troubled. He, <laughs> He, he felt that he had been duped in a certain way, I think, and um, he was very opposed to the idea of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, and he felt that the bombs could have been used on, um, on, on military inst installations instead of civilian um, cities. Um, and there, it was, he, was, he was really a very interesting lecturer because he, he had a lot of feelings about the, the whole process of the uh, development of the atomic bomb. Uh, then there was W.H. Auden. He was there. And, the, and um, then, of course, there were the, the, the folk singers that were not allowed in any other colleges that, except Reed, Pete Seeger came, and um, and um, some several other of these uh, the folk singers that were um, um, excluded from public performances at other colleges. So, and that was a, a great part of it too. Had a well-rounded education. Well, when it came uh, time for grad school, you came to UAF. Why, why did you choose that? Well, it's Alaska, come on. <laughs> if, you, if you go west, because the west is something, <clears throat> and they say, well, Alaska, it's even more, right? Um, I, had, I, I was sort of limited. I wasn't the best, uh, uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer there. And I had applied at um, three schools at Boston, um, New Mexico Tech, and, and Alaska. And um, I, I received assistantships from all of those, but um, uh, I, Alaska was right in the right place at the right time, actually. And it was besides the, the salary at that point was greater than my professors, so that I, as an assistantship, <laughs> so that was a, a, a draw too, I guess. I can see that, yeah. Now, when you came up, this is in 1958? Yes. Give us a thumbnail sketch about who was here and what some of the memory. Of course, you mentioned that, that it was the International Geophysical Year, too. Yeah, that was a, a big thing. And, and of course, um, when um, I think one of the biggest things that um, awakened the interest in it actually was the Great Red Aurora of uh, 19. Uh, 58, uh, uh, Jan uh, February 10th, 11th, uh, 1958. It was actually my uh, first date with my wife and myself at that point. Uh, it was February 58. And um, we went out to the, the Portland Symphony and on our way back we could see the sky was a fire. And we thought, and, you know, for at first, as everybody else in Oregon thought of, was forest fires. But um, it was uh, uh, actually the aurora, the great red aurora. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I suppose that really 
spiked everyone's interest in the IGY because the solar activity at that point was higher than it had ever been recorded. And it's, um, it was the peak actually of, of the number of sunspots and, and the amount of energy from the sun um, that uh, actually since we've been tabulating from the 1600s or so. And um, so it, when we arrived here, when I arrived here, it was uh, a red aurora every night. It was, the atmosphere was just um, hot. And this meant that there was a greater spread outness of the atmosphere. And so what aurora did, what particles came from the sun, uh, and started the great um, uh, generator that produces the aurora was exceptional at that point, and we had a lot of red aurora every every night. It was a, it was aurora all the time, and of course I thought that was the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> um, but then, uh, <coughs> within two two years, actually, 1962. The activity had dropped so much we had to invent a new year and we called it the International Year of the Quiet Sun, this to generate more funds to, to, keep, to keep, up the work, keep up the good work. But, Marketing is so important. <laughs> yes. So IQSY came along then. Well, I'm going to take a short break from academics to talk about and you kind of nicely segue to this about your marriage and other ventures. Now, you met Tony and Reed. When did you marry? And she, she didn't come up originally with you in 58, is that No, right? no. Um, she went back to the University of Oslo and um, got her degree there in um, anthropology under Charles Barth, who is a famous anthropologist. Um, and uh, um, then, and, and she taught in Finland, Finnmark, which is up, up in northern Norway uh, with the, among the Laps for six months. And so she had quite a bit going there. And then um, in um, June of 1960, I went over there, the first time I'd actually been out of the country except for Canada. Um, and f I flew in on a SAS airplane from New York City and I was scared and um, uh, we were um, married in Tanum Chirkiu which is a church outside Oslo actually but it's uh, we were registered in in Oslo for our marriage license and so forth. Did you learn Norwegian? Depends on who you talk to. <laughs> I, um, I, do re I, I do actually really well with fellow scientists, colleagues, you know, because they sometimes have trouble with English, so they're quite, you know, liberal with how it goes. But uh, otherwise, um, uh, my wife calls it pigeon Norwegian. <laughs> um, but I, I, I can get along. Okay. Well, I, you, you mentioned aircraft. When you first came up, you were on a strato cruiser. Is that right? Yes. That's a, a wonderful uh, airplane. I've always loved that one. Well, getting around is it was a lot different. When I went to school in Portland, I would take the train from Chicago, from actually Muskegon, Michigan. Um, and it took, uh, from Chicago to Portland was 37 hours. Um, my grandmother would cook up a bunch of chicken in Chicago and I would get on the train and a day and a half later we'd be there um, in, um, in Portland. So I did that one last time and came up to, to Seattle and took um, Pandemonium Airlines uh, on the Strato Cruiser. And the thing I remember about it is the seats were very, I mean, I was in economy, but the seats were very, they were wider. It was multi-story too, wasn't it? I, I didn't adventure around it. I, I don't remember. But I do remember that it would kick back and forth like this. Sideways, you would, and the wings would remain stable, but 
it was a strange era. It was a little strange, it, but it was yeah. roomy. Yeah. It was roomy. That's the yeah. difference. <laughs> So important, so different than today. But it was six and a half hours from yeah. Seattle to Fairbanks, so it's quite well, a bit different. When you and Tony were married, you went on a hike for your honeymoon. You've always been outdoor enthusiasts, and you were part of the Alaska Alpine Club when you were here, right? Yeah, I guess I guess Neil Neil got us going. Neil Neil Davis got us going on that. That was. Um, uh, he had been part of the earlier group of the Alaska Alpine Club and, and Shin and a couple of others here are, um, uh, were also along on these various expeditions we mounted at that point to get out in the Alaska range. It was really nice because you could, you could go into really nice country um, just by driving down to Delta in a few, few more miles. Mm -hmm. And you summited you made the first summit of Mount Rita. Yeah, um, my old roommate from college and um, Gene Westcott and uh, his, his friend uh, John Gardy. Uh, we flew from Anchorage to Polly Creek and um, stayed at a trapper cabin there uh, and then um, walked uh, along the beach and then it, it was really a, an ideal climb because Volcanoes are really nice. They always have an easy route. You don't have to be technically great for a volcano because it's a cone, basically. And despite explosions and erosions, there's a good route. And so we went up this up, up redoubt, and Gene would always look at the marks in the snow, and he'd say, "Huh, someone's been here before us." You know, he, Gene was that a little uh, paranoid about it. But um, yes, we made it up first, I guess. Um, it was good. It was a great climb from sea level to 10,000 feet. Well, coming back now to, to science, you, you came up here and as you mentioned, the aurora was blazing away. Um, how much was known about the aurora? We've, I've talked to several people in, in these interviews so far and and I'm always interested to know what the knowledge base was when you were younger and what happened. You're a forecaster now for heaven's sake. So, yeah. Well, at, the, at that point, um, we essentially knew roughly where the greatest occurrence frequency occurred, where it happened most often, all in a, in a ring around the pole. And we knew that it was related to somehow to the sun, and we knew that, um, that uh, we knew the spectrum. We could see the spectrum of the aurora, so we knew that it was, it was making atmospheric atoms and molecules glow. Um, but after that, um, the real dynamic picture of it was pretty much developed here. Uh, Neil Davis counted publications, actually, and um, we, the Geophysical Institute, had more publications in the year 1966 than Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, they were busy with other things, apparently, yeah. but, but I think the fundamental discoveries about the aurora occurred here. I, I wasn't a contributor to all of the fancy things that went on, but um, uh, Shin Nakasofu and Neil Davis and um, any number of other um, people here were um, involved in describing, actually, um, all the details that could be, that could be um, deduced at that point. Um, and you were in a cabin up in Fort Yukon, weren't you, during one of the Well that was the Lisa Barron, was it? The first first rocket shots. Yes. Yeah. Um, that? Well that was not a cabin. I, there are guys who <laughs> there are guys who went on in tents, right, Neil? 
<laughs> we were at the bachelor officer's quarters at the, at the Air Force Base, which was definitely not a cabin. Um, and um, yeah, that was the first, uh, the first uh, rocket campaign. Um, Neil had put together a rocket range and uh, he, Neil could get everybody together and get them all working. Uh, so what our job was to locate the cloud using two television cameras and transmit that position of the cloud to a radar in uh, Kodiak. The people in Kodiak couldn't see the aurora because they were too far south, but the radar, they wanted to find out what, what a large char, um, co accumulation of charge would look like to their radar over the horizon. So it was the first development of over the horizon radar as I understood it. Um, but anyway, our job was uh, simply to um, triangulate on on the clouds. Um, it was a, something we would do, we could get it done I'd, in a week now, but it took us a good six months to develop some kind, everybody worked on it. I, uh, we ended up, we had a, an IBM 360 computer and um, in those days, it was a business computer, just like our, our desktop machines, mechanical things, they were just business, business computers. So you typed in and you got print out. But we needed to get information from Fort Yukon, the angle, of, angle and azimuth, azimuth and, angle, uh, and altitude angle of the TV down to Kodiak. So what we ended up doing was sending the signal from the little servos on the, on the television mount to solenoids that were mounted on the typewriter. And those solenoids would type in the angle of view and the computer would compute where in space that is then we had to program the lights on the back of the computer to tell the answer to some photocells, which would send an electrical signal by telephone to Kodiak. And then they would type in where the radar should look. It took eight minutes. So we would, I would sit up at, at Fort Yukon and direct my television toward the the um, cloud, and Jerry Romick was at, at Esther Dome Observatory, and he would point his TV at the cloud, and then we would push a button, and then eight minutes later, they would read where the cloud is down in Kodiak. Wow. And now, you know, this, yeah. <laughs> it would be <laughs> so much Less easier. <laughs> Well, you gave a lot for science. I read somewhere that you and Tony were in a trailer on top of Esther Dome during some of these <coughs> observations. Yeah, that was, we were, um, I guess, we, we stayed in, our first year we stayed in uh, the little cabin where the, the Baptist church is now. And it was uh, rented to us by the um, the engineer of the, the discovery of Jim Binkley's boat and um, Vince James. And he said this, this little cabin was good. Uh, it was air insulation and then had sawdust in the roof, so it was plenty, plenty warm. But that was the winter of 1961 and um, it stayed below 40 below for about three weeks in December. Uh, it came up to 20 below in, uh, on New Year's Eve and we all went out in t-shirts. It was just amazing. Um, but um, then they sold, uh, uh, Vince James sold the cabin to the Baptist Church. So they were going to build there and 
So we had to move out and we, my dad helped us. We bought a trailer and moved it up to Ernie Kaiser's land on top of um, Esther Dome next to the newly built observatory there. And um, um, so we sp spent um, a year there uh, or a winter yeah. up there. Um, I was um, actually, um, I had an earache that, that um, uh, we had telephone contact, but the road was often blown closed. And uh, so my uh, wife skied into town from the top of Esther Dome and got from uh, Dr. Dunlap a prescription for Sudafed. It was a new thing that had just come out, and this would apparently work for my earache. Uh, and then she used our dog to, to uh, ski jar back up and um, to bring me the, the medicine, just like. Uh, I was like, no. Yes, right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I did run. Uh, yes. Well, I have to ask you. Um, after you received your doctorate, you spent a postdoc period over in Norway. And was, and of course, this isn't a time when we had good international relations with Europe at that point. Um, and so yes. I'm wondering what that process was like. For, for me, it was delightful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was falling into the garden of paradise for, for um, the uh, several groups. Well, it was, it was called ESRO then, European Space Research Organization. And um, they had uh, groups from uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, uh, Denmark, uh, England, Germany, and, and the Netherlands. Uh, working on, a, on their first satellite, ESRO 1A and 1B, Aurora and Boreas, uh, the two satellites. These were low altitude satellites that were launched um, in polar orbits in, um, in October of 1968. And um, they had just been working for five years to get these these satellites together. It was the first satellites. They put poured their souls into it. Now the satellites were up, and they said, "Holy cow! What do we do now?" You know, it was a sort of a a, a thing. They finally, and I fell right into that because I came from, you know, the Geophysical Institute where Akasofu had uh, documented the uh, auroral substorm and. Uh, uh, Neil Davis had created, uh, or they found conjugate aurora. I mean, w we knew everything about aurora. Um, fortunately, um, I had some of it had rubbed off on me, so I said, "Yeah, this is great. I can do this." <laughs> um, and it was it was great because the first meeting we had was a little bit problematic because. Everyone brought their overheads. In those days, you had overheads or, or huge lantern slides. And everyone brought all their data, but it was all plotted to a different scale. So you couldn't compare anything. So the first thing I did was run up to the bookstore, buy a pad of five cycle by um, 60 centimeter um, uh, graph paper and hand some out to everybody and said, plot all your data on this for these and such and such passes. And so the next meeting was really quite productive because we could put them all together and compare them. And, but you know, when you think about it today, <laughs> plotting all that data, <clears throat> all those data on, um, on uh, graph paper, uh, it was a crude but effective. It was a great, great project. I got a huge publication out of that one that I really didn't deserve. <laughs> Well, the graph paper alone, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, but Svalbard, talk to me a little bit about Svalbard, because you won the Nansen Award, in part for your work up at Svalbard. Yes, Svalbard was a, another thing. Um, the, 
in talking to the Norwegians, they had, they had uh, said that, well, yeah, the d daytime aurora, you can see the daytime aurora up there because you could, it was dark 24 hours, but uh, it was also uh, located in such a way that the um, auroral zone passed over it uh, during the day. It's at about 75 degrees north. It's about 800 kilometers north of Point Barrow. Um, and things are oriented in such a way that you can see the noontime aurora. And the noontime aurora is very special because it uh, has a, a totally different character from most of from the aurora and the rest of the uh, the rest of the auroral oval. Um, and so I uh, convinced them that we should put a camera and a and a, and a, a scanning uh, photometer up there, and uh, they said fine. Um, so they, we built a, a little hut and I took the cameras up on a coal boat. I, we went by train to, to Trumse and then got on the, a coal boat and spent two days um, in, uh, the, uh, on the way across the, the no northern Norwegian Sea to, to um, to a coal mining town named Longyearbyen, was built by an American named Longyear. Um, it was a, quite a crossing. Uh, the technician who came with me, um, his father was a sea captain, and he said that uh, the best way you can you can handle uh, this, this rough sea is to uh, eat as much as you can, because you're, with your stomach full, uh, you won't get sick. So, you think he was pulling your leg? <laughs> well, it worked actually, I, I, <laughs> and that was the surprising thing because I had the the the, uh, the people at the university knew how to do things in Norway, and so I was listed as hair doctor professor Charles Deer, and so I got the the um, the cabin next to the captain's cabin. At the at the top of the of the rear of the ship, where things are much calmer than the poor people who were in the focusal, who had to come to dinner across a deck that was continually awash, the a coal boat that is empty, bobs like a cork, and uh, when it's full, of course, coming back, we had this a different problem. It was so low in the sea that the sea washed over it quite a bit. So. It was quite an experience. It, it was, um, uh, and and uh, it, it's just full of little discoveries. I, I was in the library trying to read some. They have a library on this ship, and um, I pulled down um, one book that was um, um, written by the husband of my wife's stepsister and about his adventures along the eastern coast of Africa, sailing up and down the eastern coast of Africa. So I had this crazy book there that um, just fell out of it, out of the library. The other fascinating thing is to go to a company town where the company prints the script that you use to buy everything. Um, it, it's a fascinating place. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way anymore, but uh, at that time, all they did was mine coal and uh, keep the Russians from uh, taking over the islands. Um, there's a long story about Norway's uh, acquisition of, of Svalbard and its governance, um, but I think that would be a little too detailed. Anyway, we put up the, the station and then um, a, about f seven years later, I got enough money from the National Science Foundation to build a real observatory up there. And uh, so uh, with, um, together with um, um, Abbas Sivji, who was here at the time, and um, my colleague from Tromsø, Kjell Henriksen, um, we started the um, the Svalbard Observatory, and the idea was to observe the, the aurora during noon and, and at, from Poker Flat at night. 
And it turns out that the, when the substorm normally starts or when the aurora activates a lot of the time, in the evening here, um, the Svalbard passes under the noon side. And since the aurora is activated from the front side of the Earth, the idea was to find out how the, these two stations related. And the interesting thing we recorded right away, of course, was that the, the, the oval expands at the same rate at both places at the same time. So the, as the solar wind comes and starts the generator that generates the currents flowing in the atmosphere, um, in, the, in the magnetosphere or the, magnet, the Earth's magnetic field, um, the, um, it happens that the entire oval expands at the same time. So what's happening on the day side then is transmitted almost immediately to the night side. So that means that the magnetic field itself is reacting all over to, this, to, the, um, to the onslaught of the solar wind. Uh, and and the uh, the beginning of the auroral activity. Um, a couple of questions. Hearing you talk, I'm wondering in your time how satellites uh, changed at all. Well, you you've heard my excitement over the first satellites from Europe. Um, <laughs> That's right. the, the, we found an awful lot out about the aurora by just looking at the night, uh, at the at the looking at the aurora and observing it. And um, when we were uh, we were able to see w when the orbital and the suborbital data were taken. In other words, when we had rockets and we had satellites in the 1970s, we began to be able to measure what was coming in. The difference is before all we had was what we could see from the ground. But if you can fly something through above the aurora, you can see what's coming in and making the aurora. And so that you know, more than doubles the information you have and you can, you can calculate what, what is making this thing. And uh, so the satellites and, and the rockets uh, were good in that sense that we could have a better picture of what was going on, but there is what's called a space-time ambiguity associated with spacecraft. Spacecraft always have to move. There's no still spacecraft. You can't just put a spacecraft up there and say, here, we'll leave it right there, because the mechanics of orbits and everything don't let you do that. So they're always moving. And it's difficult to tell the difference between whether it's a motion through something, through a luminous auroral arc or through a cloud of something, or whether that cloud is changing in brightness. So that's called the space-time ambiguity. So what that does is that for those of us who are stuck on the ground looking up, gives us a job because we can by looking at what they're seeing when the spacecraft is going through, we can tell them whether it's uh, motion or change in brightness. So that's the, uh, everything began to work together in the 1970s. Well, and you also had a stint as director of Poker Flat too, didn't you? Well, that was a bit farther on. Um, Do you want to talk about a few other programs or things that stand out for you before we get let's, to that? Let's do that. Yeah, okay, well. Uh, I, One of the things I think that was really important, but it's, it's often overlooked, is the, the business of the programs developed in the funding agencies of the, of the US by the scientists who apply to those funding agencies. It's different here in, in America than in Europe, for example, where um, the funding is, is entirely differently distributed. But here in America, we have to write proposals to a government agency. When, in 1958, the National Science Foundation was very young. Um, the government was young. The government sent us checks. Hilde Haight, the manager at the Geophysical Institute, would sign the check and put it in a, uh, an interest-bearing account. 
And she piled up that interest for good things, but it was really against the law. <laughs> 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 well, no, she lost her job over it. Um, but anyway, as I say, things were a lot le less formal then. And, but, and I think that uh, our contribution to it, I, uh, Jerry Romick and I were on a, on a committee uh, to develop a, a program for, um, for coordinating the observations of the atmosphere. And we uh, wanted to give National Science Foundation a, a method of attack to the problems of studying the atmosphere that everyone in the US, all scientists, could follow and end up with much more than if we all just did our specialties. And um, that really rang a bell in, in Washington. Unfortunately, we did it for nefarious reasons. The problem was to set up an optical station um, for those of us who look at the sky uh, took only about somewhere between 50 or 100,000, depending on what so kind of instrument you have. Uh, unfortunately, the radar people, people who operate in uh, the electromagnetic spectrum where the wavelengths are long, the instruments are large, and um, they were taking a million dollars to set up their station to do what we think was, of course, the same sort of thing we did for one-tenth the cost. So they were soaking up all the money. So we said, well, we'll give you an, a, a whole program based on ground-based observations optical. And this gave us the, the, um, the rather clumsy acronym uh, JABOA, Ground-Based Optical Aronomy. That was our contribution, you know. So after, after, we, got, after we got things together and, and met with other people from other universities and pulled it all together, um, it was named Cedar, and I can't remember who uh, it was who um, thought up the name, but it, it meant coupling energetics, dynamics of the upper, uh, dynamics and energetics of atmospheric regions. Don't tell me how I remember all that. It, it just starts with coupling. It's impressive. Yeah, oh yeah. Anyway, cedar was easy to say and nobody can remember what it means. Um, but that was, a, that was a, quite an accomplishment on our part because um, uh, one of the images I have from that is um, from this globe right out here. It's, it's six feet in diameter, the globe in the globe room. A lot of you have seen that. The relief on that globe is um, is amplified 40 times just so you could see that Pike's Peak is there, for example. Um, but if we were to put the whole thing to scale, all of humankind and the biological, from the deepest ocean to the last bacterium in the sky, is only what, 24 kilometers. And that, on that scale of that globe, is inside the coat of paint. <laughs> it's a human hair thickness. And all of that is where we live and muck up. It's so easy to do because it's so thin. And the only way it can exist and stay somewhere near 20 degrees C is because we've got this magnetosphere out there and a lot of things protecting us from the vagaries of space. So it's a, lot, a big thing that I like to, to point out that we really, um, and, and it was part of our argument uh, about the seriousness of aronomy, which is the study of the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, it actually rang a bell that um, this was a, um, uh, an, important, uh, an, an important program for uh, preserving life on Earth, actually. Anyway, 
that's an aside. That was, an, that was a, one of the big programs, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because you raised this point. It's so interesting, it, it strikes me today, that we have this ambivalent attitude towards science, uh, politically and socially in this country. Um, a lot of people discount uh, the science surrounding global climate change. And yet at the other side of the equation, we celebrate the American ability to investigate and look and, and explore. So uh, I always, when I get a scientist, I want to know, what do you think about that? I mean, are we doing a good job communicating science? You just did a well, marvelous job kind of condensing everything to a coat of paint on a globe, explaining, you know, just the narrow band we do them. Do you have any insights about that? It's, it's um, I, I, I've been so fortunate to spend my entire working life um, dealing with science where it's, it's a rational enterprise. Yes, and to communicate any of it, it has to involve linear thought. No, I mean, you get inspiration, that's true, but ultimately, you have to explain it in a linear manner so that other people can understand it. I find that, um, uh, that all too often people could use a little science in, in, in politics. I, I, I'm not sure that scientists make good politicians, um, but I think that politicians could use a, a bit of, 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 of uh, linear expression of rational thought. Um, I, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> let's leave it at that. Yeah. We're angels here to trade, I, I, I understand that. Well, let's go back though to Hooker Flat because um, of course it's, it's a remarkable institution and so um, what stands out from your time as director there? Well, what, how much everybody else had done before me. I mean, <laughs> here we have Neil, the director, and, and Dan, who <laughs> I think Dan was, Dan was the safety officer who um, pointed out to NASA that there were 2,500 people living in our impact zone <laughs> and so forth. Um, so there were a lot of people ahead of me. Um, I think it was when Shin wanted to um, get the rocket range up to code. We really had to get up to code. Neil, uh, the two Neils had started early on um, and put together the whole range without the um, the luxury of funding. And so it was a lot of war surplus and a lot of um, things that had to be improved. And at that point, um, um, Shin had a relationship with Senator Stevens who recognized that Alaska had fallen behind and really needed to have some deserved something that the other states had, had accumulated. And um, so the, the upgrade of Poker Flat began. And uh, this, we wanted to make this a, um, uh, we, we wanted everyone to participate in this also. So my job was to write up what all about the proposals for the different instruments, uh, the different scientific instruments that we were going to have and arrange for all these different committees associated with each type of instrument to come to town. And of course, at that point, we didn't have any hotels in town. So um, when they came in the summer, there was really no place to stay. And you should hear some of the stories of the people who have been, who we farmed out uh, to the Chattanooga Lodge and to the, uh, um, a couple of um, disturbingly um, 
reclusive um, uh, motels downtown. Um, but anyway, th that problem has solved itself. Uh, the, um, the, the upgrade itself then expanded so that we soon, I was uh, really just uh, overseeing the science and uh, the engineers had really taken over and um, so I was only um, peripheral actually after about two or three years. So, um, but it was, a, it was a great experience, uh, certainly one of the most eye-opening ones um, uh, regarding the vagaries of funding and um, what, uh, how your colleagues look at you when you have funds that are, um, shall we say, um, um, more than theirs. <laughs> well, having known a few meteorologists, I know it's a daunting thing to be a forecaster, but uh, you became an aurora forecaster and were part of, was part of that program. Talk a little bit about that. Well, that was another thing. We was really lucky. I, I met Shin in the elevator one day on my way. He was on the sixth floor as director, and I came in I, down from the seventh floor, and he said, Chuck, we need to have an auroral forecast. I'm being bothered by uh, too many people calling up and asking when they should come to see the aurora. <laughs> and of course, he was an expert in this and had a, a model all ready to go, so um, he said, take it do this and so we we started using this um, model to um, uh, try to generate the a model of the solar wind which is we would look at the sun and fortunately we had satellites at that point that that could say what was going on with the sun and you see all these things bursting out of the sun but then they disappear because interplanetary space, they just diffuse and there's not enough light. And so you don't know what happens until poof, aurora. So we had um, a, a lot of satellite data and we could put it together and, and get a model. And so we started um, predicting an aurora. Uh, there are two ways that the aurora, that the, the sun generates aurora. You, one is from these fast streams that are come, what goes around comes around. So because the sun rotates 28, has a 28 day rotation, um, we could see it, um, we could see it come by and we'd see an aurora and then we'd say, okay, 28 days later, we've got another aurora. So that's nice. The other kind is an explosion that sends out from, uh, an explosion that sends material out through space. Well, if you take the Earth, well, if you take the sun as a basketball, think of the sun as a basketball, uh, the Earth is a pea, a dried split pea at that, in the other side of the parking lot. So if I'm holding the sun here as a basketball and, this, and the Earth is out there, it's a dried split pea on the other side of the parking lot. So when the sun sends something off, whether it's going to hit the earth or not is, a, is um, not a simple calculation. Right now, we've, we've started to have models that make it much easier and, and, and really, uh, really um, quite, um, quite accurate so that um, we followed through with this. Uh, when we first started out, we would uh, write out a, a, a week's forecast and then we would send out 200 fax to, faxes to different people who wanted it, mostly newspapers and, and um, uh, con chambers of commerce and that sort of thing. But then after the internet came in, we could have, um, we, we would simply we made up different um, uh, ways of, of, of our graphics were really, um, really good. Ed, Ed Hoke uh, was uh, superb um, with that, and he did a great job at 
at making the graphics, and uh, another guy named Don Rice. They both uh, had superb graphics that, uh, for our, uh, uh, our rural forecast. We are fortunate, um, after I retired the last time, there was some concern about who should do the aurora forecast, but my old graduate student, Rodney Virick, whom everyone should know something of here, um, ended up as head of the um, uh, uh, research development program at the uh, prediction laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. So uh, he's set it up now so that they have a, all the information that we need comes directly to our forecast. And I don't have to sit down and type. I, I sat down and typed in things for 20 years, actually. Um, but um, now it's, it's, it's automatic. And um, we're in the process now, actually, of improving the, the site again. It, it got askew here a while back, but I think uh, there's a fellow over at, um, uh, at the um, Arctic Inst the Institute for Arctic Research here, um, IARC, uh, Toru, he said, you know, it doesn't really mean matter what the rural forecast says. <laughs> it just gets everybody excited. <laughs> well, I think finally, the pace of change seems to be accelerating. And as you point out, equipment and methods advance. What's ahead in auroral studies? Wow. Well, um, the fact is that, well, one time, Carl Benson asked me, why do we need a magnetosphere? Uh, his compass works just fine with the Earth as a dipole field, you know. And I said, well, gee whiz, Carl. I had to think about it a while. Uh, but without a magnetosphere, we couldn't explain why the sun can produce an aurora in the sky. It just doesn't work with a dipole field that makes your compass point north. You've got to have a magnetosphere. And in that magnetosphere, the processes that occur there are processes that occur um, in a great deal of the, of, of the universe. And it's our playground here to be able to find out how these processes work and what the role of, of different wave phenomena, different currents, different temperatures, what goes on on the surface of the sun is also seen <coughs> here in the magnetosphere and the aurora. So it, it, it's a close laboratory. And there are a lot of questions left. Yeah, I wonder, as we move out and explore space and planets more, being able to see how their magnetospheres or their, their interactions with things. All the planets have auroras except Mercury. And you, the prerequisite is a, an atmosphere, and <coughs> or Mercury doesn't have an doesn't atmosphere. Have atmosphere. So well, Dr. Charles Deere, I want to thank you for talking with us tonight. And um, it's a little bit after 8, but if people have any questions that they want to pose, you intimidated me. I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> I cleared it all up. Well, that's <laughs> it. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, you mentioned s -roll. Is that they're out at King Hotspring? There's a road called Esro Road. Was there a listing post up there with that satellite? Yes. Okay, John, John Miller was in charge of that. Um, it's Esro was the European Space Research Organization. Now it's, it's, it's called something different, and I can't remember it. Um, ESA, yeah. European Space 
agency. Yeah, it's an agency now. Well, thank you.